there, and welcome to Two Eyes on the Learning, iPod ideas I'd like to share from the classroom. This is Episode 6, How We Used the Voice Memo App to Help Our Students Improve Their Written Work. I'm Kelly Power, and today I'd like to share with you the essence of our entire Collaborative Inquiry project which involves how we used the Voice Memo app to teach our students at both the grades 3 and 6 levels more deeply about peer revision, the difference between editing and revising, and how we used the iPods to help us create clear, well-organized pieces of writing. You'll be able to hear from teachers and students as we explain our goal, how we did it, the impact it had on our students, and most importantly, what we learned in this inquiry process. Let's start with Michelle and Mike. This all began as a collaborative inquiry project where we, were, our, we wanted to study how students could improve their writing process through proof revision. In our research, we came across an article by Ann Davis and Ewan McGrail called Proof Revising with Podcasting, Keeping Readers in Mind as Students Listen to and Rethink Their Writing. So what we did was we brought iPods into the revision process. We thought that we could interject it into the uh, revising and editing stage, that if they could record themselves, or in my case, uh, I read their writing into the iPod, that if they heard it back, read back phonetically and grammatically the way they had read it, that hearing those mistakes would enable them to just make those corrections. So that was our goal. We wanted to engage two senses, hearing and seeing to help students understand that listening to what they wrote would show them how it sounded to the reader, and then hopefully students would be able to rethink what they wrote and determine how to begin the revising and editing process. One thing we did experience was that this process is most effective when the teacher reads the rough work and creates the audio file for the student. Here's what Trisha, Ginny, and Mike can tell you about the different ways you can handle this task especially when you encounter an error while reading the student's work out loud. We talked a lot about how you have to walk away from your piece of writing for a day or two and then go back to it and hear it back out loud, whether it's through an iPod or having someone else read it to you or reading it to yourself out loud. It's really important in the revision process. What we did learn is that when students were reading them their own story into the iPod, they weren't reading what they wrote. They were reading what they thought they wrote. I did it where they read it themselves. The student read it themselves, and then they listened to their own work back, um, and they did not have the opportunity to have another student, a peer or a teacher, help them with the editing process. That was a disaster. That did not help at all. That's the equivalent, now that we reflect back, of saying, hey, you wrote a piece, now edit it yourself. Whether they're listening to it or not, it's like they're on their own the whole process. That's not a good idea for an eight-year-old to improve their writing. When Mike did his, he read them, he read his students into the iPod so that they could hear exactly what they wrote. So with dialogue back from Mike and then from us, we realized, you know what? Those students that are our weaker writers, we need to be reading it exactly how they've written it and then letting them have a chance first. Go back, listen, before any peer was listening to it. This is what it sounds like. They would then listen and say, that's not what it was supposed to, you know, that's not what I meant to say. Fix it. Now re The first one I read back was by a girl in my class. She's heavily into gymnastics, and she wrote all about gymnastics, right? She wrote gymnastices 12 times. That's the way she wrote it, right? So when I wrote it back, I'm like, in gymnastices, you get to blah, blah, blah. And I watched her. When she did the, when the revising, she's listening to the iPod. She's like, oh, oh, oh. Right away, she heard it. She's not spelling it right. I'm giving it to her phonetically, right? So she got it right away. Otherwise, she kept thinking, oh, that's gymnastics and everything's cool, right? When I was reading a piece of work um, into the iPod, one of my students' samples, and I came across a word that I didn't know. In the beginning, I was very um, hesitant. I didn't want to center them out, make them feel insecure. If I had to keep saying, I'm unsure, I don't know. So I, would, I was pulling them aside, okay, what does this mean? Before I would read it into it. And then I realized, you know what? 
they're gonna have to deal with it. <laughs> they're you're gonna have to go and use the means that we've given them, the tools, in order to make this word a word that we're gonna know what it means. So then it was just a matter of, okay. The, and I told them all, I said, listen, if, I, if there's a word that I'm unsure, and I'm pretty good at sounding out your words and figuring out in context what they are, but if it's so far off that I don't know, I'm just gonna let you know, I'm unsure, and you're gonna hear that. And then you have a chance to go back and, and know that you need to fix that word and you need to edit it, you know, to make it uh, make sense. So once the student audio file was created, we also incorporated peer revision, where peers would be brought into the process. And by using a revising checklist and an editing checklist, they could provide descriptive feedback to help each other with improving their work. One thing that became clearly evident was how explicit we had to be with teaching students the difference between revising and editing. Ginny and Tricia will explain this a little further. We realized how explicit we had to be for the students because we were, we were saying that at the beginning of this, we were kind of using the terms together and realizing, well, what a daunting task for an eight-year-old to write a first draft, edit it, then revise it. And it was, so we kind of used it together and found that they focused only on the editing, the capitalization, the spelling mistakes. They didn't, revision didn't come into play. So we specifically, we took away editing and you're just revising. And we, for a while, yeah, and we modeled it. We, ex, you know, got explicit. It got explicit. Had them do it in groups, and then it was in partners, and then it was independently. So that gradual release. We had to teach peer conferencing. It's really hard to edit your own work, but when you're eight, it can be a challenge. So we had to teach the revision and editing process and what the difference was and what good feedback is to give a writer. It led to a whole new element of our teaching in being able to think of yourself as an editor and giving information that would improve a piece of writing that isn't just about making spelling corrections and, yeah. and capitalizing and punctuation. Yeah, we got real explicit with revising and editing. So we did a lot of modeling of what positive constructive feedback is and what kinds of things, how you can help improve this so from doing these revisions for their peers, now when they go to write their own, they're going to remember to use voice or to get that topic sentence or whatever the criteria is, but they're, they're clicking in kind of now at the first draft stage. We built it right into the writing process. So on our pocket chart with all of our uh, you know, clothespins with their names, we had their brainstorm, their first draft, then we had them revising iPod revision. So we knew where they were but it allowed us to manage it because with eight iPods, they were all at different parts of the writing process. I will attach the checklists that we ended up creating and adapting on my website at kellypower.ca so you can see what we used. But for now, here are some of our grade three students sharing their perceptions of this peer revision process. Oh, uh, we've been recording on the microphone app we could listen to our writing because if you listen to your writing it helps you a little more and because when you're writing you make mistakes and you think it's perfect but when you listen to it it's a you could hear the mistakes that you do like we we wrote our own stories and we wrote it we all thought it was perfect but then we made really big mistakes like the boy jumped over the fence that's what we thought it said, but it's the boy, the fence. So we erased our sentence, and then we started over and did it better. They were listening for, like, if, like, there was a sentence that did not belong where it was, and just, uh, like, if it didn't sound right, or if it needed more wow words. Maybe I forgot. Like, I uh, made a sentence into a wrong position, and they switched it around for me. Uh, and the one story I did, it sounded weird. It sounded like it didn't sound right. It sounded all confusing and everything. I tried to revise it, except it didn't work after that, so I got somebody else to help me revise it. Sometimes we'll do peer revision, and we'll listen to someone else's, and we'll 
try and revise theirs. It's when you get someone else's story and you get to revise it. And then you can give them all the notes that you wrote about their story and they might be able to use them. Like using better words, um, like if you said good, you could change it to awesome or fantastic. If they're are extra words in there or anything, extra sentences, you can listen to it and see if it sounds right instead of just reading it. You might find some stuff that didn't really fit. If there was an extra and or something, you would probably just keep reading and just forget about the and, but when you listen to it, you hear the and, so you would be able to take that out. I was saying, oh, I added an extra and, I have to take that out for my good copy. Well, it's given me new ideas for my story to add on, so I can make my story better. If I missed a word, they'll tell me, because sometimes I don't really notice that. Or if I spelled the word wrong, or if uh, the lines didn't make sense, or they weren't in the proper order, it felt kind of good because now you know what to change. One final thing we learned was that you have to be aware of your learners and consider how to make this work for each student. Some of our grade 6 students reached a level where they could do their own recording, but this came far along in our process. Here's what Renee, Noreen, and Tricia will share about how this process had a different impact on different learners. When I first brought the iPods into the classroom, the kids were so excited to have a new piece of technology because they're used to paper and pencil and that was still an element of the process but they got to add technology into the process as well. So they were so excited and it made them driven I found. Um, they were so focused and so on task and I found that when they were recording into the iPods a lot of them would stop it and fix their work on their paper and then re-record and start over. So it was almost like they were trying to perfect their piece almost trying to work on that publishing stage while they were revising because they wanted it to be perfect because they were accountable to an audience, whoever that may be that was listening. The iPod made them more accountable even if it was just for themselves, for their own pleasure of hearing themselves on the iPod. They wanted to perfect it. They didn't want to hear their mistakes. They needed it to be perfected through their own eyes and ears. And held them accountable for their work. If they weren't caught up with the rest of the class, it kind of made them kick it up a notch to get caught up so that they could use the iPods to record their stories. The kids were very excited to use them at first, but the novelty has kind of worn off now and they're using them as a learning tool. They go to them when they need to revise, when they finish their first draft, they go to them for other uses that we've had in the classroom. and. They understand that there is a purpose to their use. It's not just a cool thing to have an iPod in our classroom. They've realized that it's tied directly to their learning. I've also noticed that the students have become more receptive to feedback. They're taking what their peers are saying and actually applying it to their work instead of just being like, oh, he said it's good, or the students are actually critiquing a lot more effectively. Some don't need it. Some find it's a step that they don't need, and others, cling on to it for dear life. They need to be able to hear what, it's, what it sounds like um, in order to fix their work. Some students wanted to see the, the hard copy of the written piece in front of them, so the audio was, it wasn't for them, and others kind of thrived on just hearing the, the recorded piece. But having that tool was a motivator for students that don't write because they had a goal. I'm going to use the iPod, I'm going to go onto that voice memo because it's technology, it's something different, and I want to try it and I want to use it. So at least we were getting a piece of writing from everyone. Some of the students really thrived using that technology, while others, you know what, the pencil paper, the, the, the pen in hand was their best tool. So it, it, you know, it just kind of saw that there's different learners. So the key message for this episode is to show you how you can spend a great amount of time just focusing on one app, in this case the Voice Memo app, in order to learn about the impact it could have on student learning 
when it's combined with explicit teaching strategies. It's not about doing a whole bunch of things. It's about learning deeply about one or two concepts, teaching those concepts for a while, and doing it well. Know what you want to do, know who your learners are, and think deeply about how the iPod might be an effective tool to help. Because if you consider this deeper focus on learning, it will help you keep two eyes on the learning. Join me in my next episode where I will share how a few of our teachers incorporated the iPods into the math learning that is taking place in their classrooms. But for now, you can subscribe to these podcasts at kellypower.ca. This is Kelly Power with two eyes on the learning. Bye for now.